Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Today on the AAMFT podcast, we begin a two-part series into the world of polyvagal theory. Feelings of safety emerge from inside the body, and as humans, as social beings, we are on an enduring lifelong quest to feel safe. We're equipped with built-in protective mechanisms that help us survive threatening situations. When we experience threat, we mobilize into self-protection through the sympathetic nervous system. Just as animals seek to flee or fight a predator, we too might rely on these defense mechanisms to survive. This is where polyvagal theory comes in. This theory emphasizes sociality as a core human process that helps us to mitigate threat and support mental health. More specifically, It highlights the importance that the parasympathetic nervous system and the vagal circuits play in the neurophysiological mechanisms related to trauma and trauma responses, safety and connection. That sounds complex, don't worry. Today's guest, Deb Dana, is going to help us be able to understand how valuable this theory is about to celebrate its 30th anniversary is important to practicing therapists, especially our systemic listeners. In her book, The Polyvagal Theory in Therapy, Deb explores co-regulation, a very important topic we'll talk about today. That's an interactive process that engages the social nervous system of both therapist and client. And it's common for clients with trauma, especially those with complex PTSD, to alternate between hyperarousal and hypoarousal states. However, we can help them to feel safe and connected, even in the midst of difficult emotions and body sensations. Co-regulation requires that we, as a therapist, are comfortable with a wide range of affect and arousal states. Because our clients with developmental trauma may have never had another person who was able to be with them during their distress without becoming anxious themselves, shutting down, or bailing in the midst of the client pain. So applying polyvagal theory in therapy, especially systemic therapy, involves engaging the social nervous system in ourselves and in our clients. We offer engagement as an experience of mutuality and reciprocity. When we as therapists offer our openness and receptivity to clients, they feel accepted and understood. Let me tell you about Deb Dana. She is a legend at taking the great Stephen Porges' theory and applying it to clinical work. She's an LCSW. She has an amazing story she'll tell us about today and and much of her work with systemic and working with families. She's an author, she's a speaker, and a world-class clinician and trainer. Her work is focused using the lens of this polyvagal theory to understand and resolve the impact of human trauma in our lives. Along with Stephen Porges, she is a founding member of the Polyvagal Institute. Her work shows an understanding of how polyvagal theory is applicable across the board to relationships, to mental health, and trauma. She's well known in translating this theory into a language and application that is both clear and accessible for therapists and the general public. And for her pioneering rhythm of regulation methodology, her tools, techniques, and practices, some which she'll share uh, with us today in the interview. Deb believes that we all benefit when we have a basic understanding of the ways the nervous system works and learns how to become active operators of this essential system. You can read her many books, as I said, The Polyvagal Therapy and Theory from Norton, The Rhythm of Regulation, 
There's also polyvagal exercises for safety and connection. This two-part series, one with Deb Dana, and as I'll say after the interview, the other with the founder of the theory, neuroscientist extraordinaire, Stephen Porges, is some of the, I think, best interviews in the five seasons of the podcast. I'm so excited to bring that to you, our listener, with a systemic bent, as the AMFT podcast always does. We will be back after this very thought-provoking and educational interview with Deb Dana. Working as an independent marriage and family therapist can be very rewarding. But working outside of the typical W-2 employee structure can be a difficult transition for many of us. That's where a company like Opolis comes in. Opolis is helping independent therapists focus on what they do best. While Opolis manages the back end. Opolis leverages group buying power, helping you save up to 50% on premium healthcare options through Cigna. Through their platform, you can receive bi-monthly pay stubs, annual W-2s, and compliant tax withholding and remittance. Learn more at Opolis. That's O-P-O-L-I-S dot co slash therapist. Opolis dot co slash therapist. Eli, back with you on the AAMFT podcast, talking to a pioneer in integrating polyvagal theory into clinical practice, Deb Dana. Thank you so much, Deb, for joining us. The first question is always about our experts' therapeutic origin story. How did you get interested in psychotherapy? And then specifically your journey into working with trauma and integrating polyvagal theory. Oh, we're going to go a long way back here, aren't we? I got my bachelor's degree in in social welfare decades ago, and then my life took a different path. And I did a lot of other things, working in schools, working in substance use recovery, working at a newspaper, magazine, but not doing the clinical work that I had thought I would be entering into. And then when I was 50, my life changed again and my kids were grown, were gone. I was on my own. And I was actually sitting in my own therapist's office one day saying, I don't know what I want to do next. And she helped me explore. And I came back the next week and said, okay, I decided I'm going to go get my MSW. So I returned to school a long time after I got my BSW and entered into the MSW program. And because I was an older, non-conventional student, I did things my own way and combined my uh, master's program with a trauma course at what was then the uh, Bessel's Trauma Program. So I did things simultaneously, thinking, I have I want to make up for lost time. That really was the beginning of my clinical work, and I've always been interested in neuroscience and was part of a very small agency focusing on trauma work and not the typical big agency that most of us in the social work world have to be with for a couple of years to get our supervised hours. It was an important moment in my life to be with this particular group of people, and um, they also were neuroscience nerds along with me, and, and we did a lot of work exploring the brain, which at that time was where everybody was focused. And then um, along the way, you know, in 2011, Steve Porges's first book was published, and I read that book, The, Co- the Polyvagal Theory, and all of a sudden it was as if, oh, something that has been missing in my world has just appeared. And I then decided, okay, I really love this theory. It explains so much about the work I'm doing. How do I bring it to clinical practice? Because Steve is a brilliant scientist in the academic world as well, but not a clinician. And so so I want to do something with this. And I reached out to Steve and invited him to come to Maine, where our group, it was then called Island Institute for Trauma Recovery. It still is in existence. We did a lot of family work at that time, and we had spent years focusing on trauma treatment, understanding ways of working, and creating new ways of bringing trauma work into clinical practice. So it seemed 
as if Steve coming to Maine and presenting would be a wonderful addition. And he, of course, said, yes, I'd love to. He's a very generous, kind, humble, and brilliant human. And he came to Maine and spent several days with my group and with me. And that was where it all emerged in a deeper way. We got to know each other. He respected the work I was doing. I got to ask him lots of questions about what if I do this? What happens in in the nervous system? And we began this sort of lifelong collaboration has been going since then. And I tell him often, without him and his work, my work would not be possible. So we always want to send great gratitude to Steve for the brilliant work he is, has done and is continuing to do on developing a deeper understanding of how our nervous system impacts our world. And again, for me, it was not just my clinical world, right? As it is for all of us, our nervous system leads us through our personal lives as well. And so that combination of work and personal was important for me, has been important for me to help others understand. I'm a social worker, and we know as social worker, we're always interested in systems. Our client doesn't exist on their own. They're embedded in all sorts of systems. So understanding my personal nervous system has been important because I understand my nervous system is then connecting with my client's nervous system and we are forming a shared system and then it moves out from there. As a systems person, the nervous system was a a perfect landing spot. Yeah, let's stay with that. Why is understanding the autonomic nervous system so important when we think about mental health and relational health? Yeah, it, it, it is. And physical health, right? It's all the same because the nervous system is at the heart of every lived experience we are having. The nervous system um, moves us into a state of regulation and open for connection or one of the survival states, either fight and flight or shut down collapse and into a pattern of protection. And from that nervous system movement, information, energy and information gets fed up to the brain. There are these bi-directional pathways and 80% of the pathways go from the body to the brain. That information gets sent up to the brain and the brain's job is to make up a story to make sense of what's going on in the nervous system, in the body. And the brain then takes that information and creates a story. And as you think about the stories your brain creates, I know my brain can create some pretty fantastic and also catastrophic stories, right? And so that's what's happening moment to moment. So important that we understand what state am I in? Am I in a state of connection or protection? Because it helps me understand the information, the stories, the behaviors, the feelings, the body sensations that are emerging. Because each nervous system state has its own qualities and properties so when I'm in the state of connection, I am open to change. I am open to, to learning. I am ready to engage. And as a therapist, I need my client to have enough of that energy accessed, be, ability to be accessed in order for them to engage in working with whatever they have come to me to work with. They're coming to me to make a change. And biologically, Change is impossible unless there is enough of this energy of connection and safety, the energy of what we call the ventral vagal system. In order for me to engage with my client, I have to help them come to enough of that energy, have at least a, a you know, a, a foothold in that place. They don't have to be immersed in it, but have a foothold in that place to engage in the therapeutic process. What we know, and we've known this forever, is that the therapeutic alliance is so important. But polyvagal theory puts the science underneath that and lets us know that my nervous system state is being communicated to my client's nervous system and is either sending them a welcome, cues of safety, or a warning, cues of danger. And so my ability to know where I am and regulate into that ventral state of safety and connection so that I offer those cues to my client's nervous system is essential for creating the therapeutic alliance is essential for success in therapy. So in the the therapeutic world, we can see that the incredible importance of understanding the science 
of autonomic connection because that is where it all begins. If we take that out of the, the therapy session, either an individual where there's two nervous systems, mine and my clients, couples, three nervous systems, families, multiple nervous systems, colleagues, again, multiple nervous systems. If we move into the personal realm in our family, friends, people we live with and love, it's the nervous system communication that is happening micro moment to micro moment. And that communication then points us in a direction either toward connection or into protection. So well said. And I think another reason this theory has been so popular in the last decade is because you're right. As therapists, we have to understand our own nervous system, get to a place where we are open for connection if we are going to be able to be there and teach our clients how to do it. So I think it works even on a self of therapist level in addition to creating the necessary ingredients for a strong alliance. So obviously a threat to connection and what leads to protection is trauma. So talk about how trauma impacts both branches of the nervous system, both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Yeah, and trauma shapes us. The nervous system is shaped by our um, lived experience, micro moment to micro moment. It's shaped by what's happening in the world around us, in our relationships with others, and also inside our own um, embodied systems. So illness shapes the nervous system. Um, living in a dangerous environment shapes the nervous system. Being surrounded by unpredictably present or dysregulated others shapes our nervous system. The hopeful news and the good news that I want to just put in here before we talk more about trauma is that the nervous system continues to be shaped every moment, of course, across our lifetime. Even though I may have grown up in a dangerous world surrounded by dangerous or unpredictably present people, and I have patterns of protection that have been wired into my biology, those patterns are continuing to being shaped by what's happening now. And so if I'm now surrounded by people who are regulated, who bring me a different experience and my environment has become safer, my nervous system takes that in and moves more towards connection. But what we know about trauma is that early trauma, developmental trauma, doesn't allow us to exercise what we call the circuits of connection, right? We don't have predictably regulated others in our life who we can do that back and forth with. And the nervous system learns very quickly to not reach out. If people are dangerous, the world is dangerous, don't reach out. And then we move into a pattern of sympathetic fight and flight, anger, anxiety, those pathways, or a pattern of dorsal disconnect, become invisible, get very small, quiet in order to survive. Those are the survival pathways. And our nervous system Although we do travel to both of those survival states, both the sympathetic fight flight and the dorsal branch of the parasympathetic shutdown collapse, over time, we have what I call an autonomic profile and, and we move into one of those survival states more easily, more quickly. And so when we work with adult clients, we're curious about their autonomic profile. And when we're listening early, in the assessment process, what happened, what has been their life story. We're listening. Were they the kid that got really big and acted out, got noisy, ran away all the time? Or were they the kid that tried to be invisible and fly under the radar? Because what we're looking for is not so much what happened to them, although that is important, but what's more important in this kind of work is how did your nervous system respond to those traumatic moments, because that's going to then give us the pathway to treatment, right? How does your nervous system respond then and still respond now? So trauma shapes the nervous system towards protection rather than connection. And if when we were young, there weren't co-regulating others for us to um, connect with, we had to then self-regulate instead. And we know the developmental trajectory is we learn to co-regulate. And from that safe base, we then reach out into the world and, and experiment with self-regulation. So if that wasn't possible, then we had to self-regulate for survival rather than from safety. 
you just took a beautiful, complex subject and distilled it down into very manageable terms, not for only our listeners, but how a therapist would describe that to their client in a very non-pathologizing way to explain how we are the way we are and how trauma shapes us. So I just love how you said that. When you're thinking of polyvagal theory, synonymous is that term neuroception. Tell us about neuroception, how it relates to what we're talking about. Neuroception is a word that Steve created when he was developing the theory because there was no word that described how the nervous system takes in information. The closest word in the English language was perception, but perception involves the thinking parts of the brain, involves your cortex, and the nervous system takes in information without benefit of the thinking parts of our brain. We can then invite the brain to come in and bring in awareness, but at its fundamental level, neuroception is working below the level of awareness. And neuroception is just always scanning for cues of safety and danger. And it uses three pathways. It uses inside, outside, between pathways. As we're doing this morning, our neuroceptive pathway of the inside embodied pathway is scanning our breath our lungs, our digestion, our viscera, our, the energy moving through our body to take a reading. Is it safe or dangerous inside there? And we really want to look for cues of both. We don't usually have just safe or just danger. We have a mix. People listening can do a quick scan inside your body. Look for cues of safety and cues of danger because we will find both. That's inside. Outside, the nervous system listens into the environment around us again, for cues of safety and danger, right? And again, if you just take a moment and listen into your environment, wherever you are seated right now or listening right now, and look for a cue of safety, a cue of danger, right? And this is how I start with clients. This is the clinical practice. Look for one, one cue of safety and one cue of danger in the beginning, right? And our clients, especially our trauma survivor clients, find it easy to find the cues of danger, more challenging to look for cues of safety. So we always want to invite, let's also look for a cue of safety. So if you do that in your environment right now, you can find a cue of danger and a cue of safety. And the final pathway is the between pathway, the, the pathway between two nervous systems, right? So again, the nervous system is listening to what's happening in another nervous system. And again, if we think about that in this moment, Eli, your nervous system and mine are, are just beginning to get to know each other. And we can find a cue of safety and a cue of danger in this relational experience. And people who are listening can think of someone they are in a connection with, any kind of connection, and find the cue of safety, the cue of danger. Right? My nervous system finds your voice very welcoming, cue of safety. Right. The fact that we have never actually seen each other's faces, we're doing this without benefit of video, cue of danger. As simple as that. Right. And again, neuroception is then going to move you either into a state of connection or one of the pathways of protection. And it does that when the cues of one side, safety or danger, outweigh the cues of the other. So if the cues of safety outweigh the cues of danger in this moment, I feel ready to engage, I'm ready to connect. If that equation shifts in the opposite direction and the cues of danger outweigh the cues of safety, our connection is going to stop, there's going to be a rupture, and the ongoing engagement comes to a standstill. We see this in our clinical work, where we're having a session where perhaps things have been flowing, going well, and suddenly something stops, right? We're no longer moving forward. That, to me, says that safety danger equation has shifted. The cues of danger now outweigh the cues of safety, and my job now is to be curious with my client about what just happened. The, the safety danger equation shifted. Let's see if we can identify what happened. Was there a cue of danger that just came in, or did a cue of safety disappear? Because I can't continue with the therapeutic um, process with the, the model I'm using, whatever it is, whatever the changes we're working with, until that safety danger equation 
shifts back again. It's an interesting way to think about, oh, I, I don't know what, I don't know why we're not moving forward. Or alternatively to think, wow, this, we're in a really good flow, right? Because if we're in a flow, I also want to identify what are the cues of safety that are supporting this beautiful work? So we talk about tears in the alliance and what you just did is beautifully explain a neurobiological definition of what a tear looks like when a client is more acute, aware of these cues of threat and, and not as aware of safety. And I think also, as you talk about this, a lot of our clients that have had significant trauma are more primed in their neuroception to see these threats. And so when you tell them that, they're probably less likely to look for things of safety. Would you agree with that? And how, how do we work with someone that has had so much imprinting of the negatives of looking uh, for danger and don't have pathways developed to tap into safety and health and strength? Yeah, I agree with you. I do think that we get shaped and we're on the lookout for the cues of danger. Our protective pathways are just ready at the slightest familiar cue to take us into that protective state and into the old story. Right. And that's done. The nervous system, again, doesn't say good, bad, doesn't assign moral meaning or motivation. It simply enacts a response in service of our safety. So we always want to remember that it, it, no matter how irrational or crazy the, the behavior, the, the story might seem in the moment, the nervous system is acting in service of our survival and safety. I, I like to explain all this to my clients because I think when they understand the biology behind um, what's happening. It, it releases some of the self-blame, shame, self-criticism, and opens the door for curiosity. So I'm big on the psychoed around the science because most of our clients come to us and some of them say, I just have a negative attitude or I'm a pessimist, right? I say, no, your nervous system has learned to protect you. So we want to be careful with trauma survivors who are clients to help them understand that the nervous system has a beautiful capacity to both be on guard for cues of danger and take in the micro moments of safety. That if you can recognize a, a cue of safety, it doesn't mean that your nervous system is still not going to protect you. Because many of my clients in the beginning were worried about noticing cues of safety, thinking they would be less safe, that their nervous system would stop looking for the cues of danger and stop keeping them safe. So it's important to help clients understand this is a both end in the nervous system. And as you have created a place of safety and connection in your work with your client, there are those moments, those cues of safety that emerge in your sessions that you can use to begin to say, you know, so in this environment, right, in my office environment or even the online environment, let's look for something that is a cue of safety to your nervous system, right? And clients, you know, in, in my, you know, actual office would often have an object that they could, they, they said, oh, I love that, or that really brings me a sense of feeling okay. I think I that's so important to be able to say, hey, just because you're gravitating and learning these cues of connection, you're still going to be able to protect yourself. The both and for a client that is really worried about losing what has innately kept them safe after significant trauma. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I, I'm just curious, since you're psychoeducating us, there's some of our listeners out there, polyvagal theory coming from the vagus nerve. They might not know where that is, or how to access it themselves, or even how to teach their client how to access it. So tell us about the vagus nerve, where it's at, and how you make yeah, connection sure. with it. Yeah, sure. The vagus is such a beautiful part of our biology, and it's the main component of the parasympathetic nervous system. And if you put one hand at the base of your neck, that's in your brainstem, that's where the the vagus nerve begins. It's a cranial nerve, and so it begins there, base of your neck, and then you might trace it around to the front, the side of your neck, down and back of where your carotid artery would be, around to the front of your body, down your throat, your heart, your lungs, all the way down to your abdomen and your digestive system. It travels all the way from your 
brainstem to your digestive system and it branches out along the way. It, it's not one nerve. It's a, a circuit of nerves. You might think about an electrical wire. And if you open the wire, you see all the different circuits inside. The vagus nerve is like that. So as it travels down, it goes out to all sorts of organs in your body and controls them. But it's a basic work if we're thinking about therapy and we're thinking about how we engage, whether we feel safe or unsafe, is a certain circuit that goes from your brainstem to your heart, to the sinoatrial node of your heart. It's a ventral vagal circuit. Its job is to manage your heart rhythms, right? And as it does that, it allows more energy in when you need more energy. And then it decreases the energy when you want to come to rest, right? So even in our conversation, as I'm talking, it allows in more energy. And as I'm listening, it, it decreases the energy. And it's a beautiful part of our biology. It's actually called the vagal break because it, it has that sort of breaking action on our heart, right? And it's working all the time. But when we grow up in a dangerous world or in a have traumatic experiences that are still sitting in our system unresolved, it may not work as efficiently as we would like it to. So instead of releasing a bit and allowing me access to mobilizing energy, instead it, it, it releases all the way. And when that happens, I am now in sympathetic survival energy. So rather than mobilizing energy that I need, I'm now in energy of fight and flight. And so that's what we're doing really in therapy all the time is we are helping clients exercise this pathway and have a more efficiently functioning vagal break, which if you're trained in the window of tolerance, it widens your window of tolerance. In my world, it, it increases my ability to access the ventral energy of connection and stay in that place longer, right? So that really is what we're trying to do. There are some ways, some physical ways that we can access the vagal nerve, access the ventral aspect of the vagus. We think about breath practices are exercising this capacity, increasing your vagal capacity, humming. Some people, some practitioners have ways of touch, right? I am not in that world. So my way of doing it is I do teach certain breath practices. I like people to figure out movements that bring that alive. What are some of the ways that self-touch helps you feel connected to this, the qualities that your ventral system brings alive? So for me, it's more about exploring with clients. What are the moments when you feel that energy of connection? And there's a whole range of flavors of that energy. It can be ease, relaxation, calm, or it can be purposeful, passionate, playful, excited, standing up for what I believe in, strong. It can be any of those flavors. And so inviting a client to first identify all the flavors and you, the way you know that you're in this place of ventral connection, engagement, is your neuroception is one of safety, the cues of safety are outweighing the cues of danger. As long as that is happening, whatever feeling you're having emerges from your ventral state. So it could even be sadness, right? Sadness that is under the ventral umbrella, so to speak, is sadness that, is, that, that moves us in some direction, that has information for us that we can take in. Because our trauma moments, our trauma memories, our trauma stories, are stored in the survival states. They're stored in sympathetic, fight, flight, and dorsal, disconnect, collapse, shut down. And in order to access those stories in a safe way, in a way that allows us to be informed by them, to do something with them, to resolve them or bring them into a coherent narrative, we have to be anchored in ventral and then take enough ventral with us to visit those other places. So you're right, accessing ventral and holding on to enough of that energy is of vital importance. And there are physical ways to do it that, that can help. There are also visual ways 
using music, using image. Breath is certainly a wonderful one, using art, using movement. My invitation for therapists is to first find your own ways. What are the ways that you know you can come to Ventral and Anchor there and then help clients find their ways, create a menu of choices? My, my anchoring categories, I do a practice of finding the who, so the people who bring me that sense of Ventral welcome. What are some of the things that I do? Small things, not big, long practices. Small things like looking out the window to see what, see what's going on in nature. Where are the places in my world when I am there, I can feel ventral regulation? And when are the moments that predictably bring me that ventral experience, right? And then we have things called touchstones. They might be your favorite t-shirt, your favorite shoes, your favorite sweater, the earrings you love, the, the things in your world, the smells, the, the objects that you, can, you might pick up and hold, right? I, I love beach stones. The beach is aware for me. It's also a what, because I collect beach stones and I have them all around my house. I can look at them when I want. I can hold one when I need. So anchors. Is it a smell for you too? The, the, yes. the, the beach yeah. salt water in the air? Yes. As you described, that's one for me too. So I think when we think of our who, our what, our when, our moments, I think it's, it's very important that this is not just, oh, we teach these one size fit all exercises to clients. It's being curious about the client, right, Deb? And what works for you might not work for your client, but if you're curious and being curious, it takes you into those very early experiences with the clients and a lot of these protective factors. Now, a, a lot of our listeners are working with couples and families. So this, while your pioneering work of taking Stevens theory and, and integrating into psychotherapy may not be associated with couples or families, but I think we, when sitting in the room with a couple where you're trying to create a sense of safety and connection and our partners feel threatened by the other person or a, a parent trying to connect with their teenager and the harder they try, the more the teenager pushes away on their attempts. So talk about how what we've been talking about the last half an hour fits into potential working with couples and families. Yeah. I, and again, if we're going to the level of the nervous system, it fits in really easily. It just becomes a bit more complicated because there's more than my nervous system and one client's nervous system. And so I'm always trying to negotiate multiple nervous system, right? And in couples, and again, I, I love what you said, that it's about, it's not a one size fits all. There is, I like to say, there's no right or wrong way. There's just the way of your nervous system. And we need to be curious. And I begin work with couples by having each couple get to know their nervous system. They do their own autonomic map of their nervous system and then share it with each other. Because that way we're getting out of the cognitive narrative that they are so stuck in and we're coming to the biology, right? So understanding that my partner's nervous system is shaped more towards sympathetic. And when my partner gets dysregulated, they go to this place of anxiety and then the anxiety emerges as being demanding right? If I can understand that and not just go to the place, the story about my partner is just always demanding and, and always needs to have their own way. If I can look underneath that to where does that emerge from? Oh, sympathetic anxiety, fear. And then the symptom is so demanding. We have to go under the symptom. If I can help one partner tell that to the other, then that changes the narrative. And then the other partner gets to share what happens for them. In couples, you often see opposite dysregulation, right? One goes to sympathetic, one goes to shutdown, right? And, you know, that makes for a certain dynamic. Pursuer, distancer, attack, it, withdraw. Yeah. Exactly. You might also see two sympathetics, and that's a very volatile system, right? A, a, a couple system, very volatile. Two attack. You might see two, um, two dorsal disconnect shutdown, and that's just a very distanced, quiet, suffering couple, right? And you have a name for that as well, I'm sure. Those are conflict avoidant, avoid, avoid. Yeah. yeah. Right. And if you're looking at the biology of this, it helps you know what needs to happen, right? When he's, and if you have one sympathetic, one dorsal, sympathetic is closer to regulation. And so I often tend to help the sympathetically activated partner find the way back to ventral. And then that partner and I will both go and meet the other person in dorsal 
and bring some energy of connection to the person in dorsal, right? Because you can't make any sort of repair. You can't come together and even have a conversation unless there's enough ventral in, in the systems, right? Not because couples don't want to, but because biologically they are unable to. It's important for us to understand that and important for us to help our clients understand that. Not that they don't want to, they are unable to in this moment. Biology has taken them away. And if you're working with parents and kids, I, and I know it's really challenging. I have been a parent, but I'm now a grandparent. And so I watch my grown children learn to parent. And this is tough work, really hard work. And the parent is responsible for being the regulating and regulated um, energy in the room. And, and just as we are as therapists, we are responsible for being regulated so that we can help regulate others. It's a big responsibility to carry. None of us do it perfectly. None of us. And if you think about your clinical sessions, there are moments when you are, are not so regulated. Might even be dysregulated. Happens all the time. The expectation is, okay, it's going to happen and I know how to make a repair. With parents and kids, we want them to understand you are not going to be the, the perfectly regulated system in the room all the time. And that's okay. That's okay. Edtronic's beautiful work about connection tells us that 30% of the time is the expectation to form secure attachment. It's just that the other 70% of the time, we recognize there's been a rupture. And when we come back to regulation, we offer a repair. I think that's important for us to know. And I use that with couples too. I say, you don't have to be in this regulated place all the time. It's not going to happen. We just have to recognize their ruptures and know how to begin to make repair. As you're talking, so many things go through my head as both a, a clinician and a clinical trainer, a supervisor, so much of a professionally young therapist to get dysregulated in the room. So just using these skills, we, again, before you teach it to a client or a client system, you have to be able to do it your own. And how many times do the therapist, when a, a couple or a family starts to become unglued, they also uh, become dysregulated. So this really works on a parallel process. We've been building toward this term, again, synonymous with the approach co-regulation, which if you're listening, you probably have figured out what that is. But tell us what the skillful therapists do to promote this co-regulation with their clients and in between the client system if you're working with multiple people in the room, because that's really the ultimate outcome of integrating good polyvagal theory into clinical practice. Yeah, co-regulation is where we're heading. Co-regulation is what we call a biological imperative, meaning it's something we have to survive. We come into the world, we can't survive without other humans supporting us, right? And yet, over the course of our lifetime, we also need that. It doesn't end just when we become self-sufficient. We need co-regulation with safe others in order to fully experience well-being. Most of our clients come to us and with the neural expectation that others are dangerous, right? There's also a huge cognitive story going on, but biologically, the nervous system has an expectation that others are dangerous. Others are going to abandon. Others are going to get angry, right? The, the, those are the biological expectations that have been wired in. So our work as a therapist is to be that regulated energy in the room and keep offering that to a client, no matter what we're getting in return. That this change happens through doing small things over and over. So it takes patience. It takes persistence. And I think it takes naming the process explicitly because it's going on implicitly behind the scenes. I want to bring it alive explicitly. And I want to notice with a client that, oh, I think we just had a moment of feeling safe enough together. That's co-regulation. I am sending out through my biology, through neuroception, also through what I'm doing and what I'm saying, through my regulated presence, I am sending that welcome to my client in multiple pathways. And when we have a moment, it feels like the client's nervous system is opened for just a moment. I notice that oh, it feels like for just a moment that felt different to you. That felt safe in a new way. So we want to keep noticing and naming. It's really what we do all the time. Notice name, 
normalize the disconnect, right? Of course, I find myself saying this often to to clients. Of course, that's the experience. Your nervous system learned and then fill in the blank, whatever's it's learned, right? Of course, it makes perfect sense. And then noticing something that was a bit different. That's our job. And yes, unglued's a good way of thinking about it. When we come unglued, and it often happens in subtle ways, it's, oh, I don't know what to do with what's happening in front of me. And I can feel myself going into my own survival response. My responsibility is to notice that for myself, to find an anchor so that I can come back to ventral. And then I think it's important to name that with my client, just to say, I just got pulled out of connection with you for just a moment, but now I'm back regulated and ready. Did you notice? Because it, as we bring this into explicit awareness, I have had so many clients, trauma survivor clients say, I, I, I felt something and know what it was. Thank you for naming that. It makes sense to me now. So we're, we're putting language, we're putting explicit awareness into what their nervous system is picking up anyway. And that's the thing we want to know. Our clients' nervous systems are going to pick it up. You can't hide it. So your job is to say, okay, I need to name this in a way that, that gives them a sense of, oh, I can trust what's happening inside their system. And I think it's also helping them understand I dysregulate just like everybody else, and I know how to come back to regulation because that's what I'm teaching them. Exactly. That's the, the three ends. Uh, so beautiful, noticing, naming, and normalizing. We talk about on the show a lot of times, and one of the, again, common factors in psychotherapy is both receiving feedback and giving good feedback to the clients. And this is a, a very great way to do that. The process, as we talk about in systems therapy, is is sometimes and many times much more important than the content of what the client or the system is telling us. So this is a feedback on the process, these micro moments in the session of connection and of safety. And even when you get dysregulated or out of sync, that you can come back into sync. And I think it's always very powerful when the therapist, even someone as expert as you, can normalize the process of how even the best of us get out of sync and have to resync. Listening to you this hour, I could talk to you for another hour. It, it is shocking to me that this is only something that you had this career change at 50, even though you have this bachelor's of social work and all these other experiences as a skilled helper. It's amazing that you've only been doing this since 2011 when you met Stevens. You're so articulate. A lot of times I have met people I've looked up to in the field we have never met, but I have read your books and you're such also a good writer. And sometimes when I read and then I actually meet the person, their in-person does not live up to the way they write. So it's ability to articulate this in writing, but also to meet you. So our listeners probably be more regulated or, or co-regulated just by listening to you. But now I am curious if you've listened to this and you've been turned on and clearly you are a, a great clinical trainer and, and therapist, what are the best resources for our litter listeners to utilize when integrating polyvagal theory into their practice of systemic therapy? You're right that if you Google polyvagal theory or vagus nerve, you will get a, a unbelievable amount of stuff coming to you on the internet. And I would encourage people to be careful to really go and read original research. You may not love doing that, but the pop psychology that you get all the time now. We have a lot of anecdotal evidence for a lot of things, but again, the research science behind it, sometimes not so much. And sometimes it doesn't matter because you can offer your clients, here are some things that might work, see what happens for you. Beyond that, I try to to put things on my website, rhythmofregulation.com. We have a lot of free offerings. We have courses. We have resources. I'm always trying to see what's next there. I think for clinicians, my my very first book, which <laughs> feels crazy to say, but my first book, I can remember putting it out there in the world, terrified of what was going to happen on the other end. And it's been such a joy to have clinicians welcoming this way of working. But the first book, The Polyvagal and Theory and Therapy, Engaging the Rhythm of Regulation, I think for clinicians is a good starting place. Um, for non-clinical, more of a lay audience, a general audience, Anchored was the book I wrote for that. And either one of those are great starting places. And then there are all sorts of other books. My 
the polyvagal practices was just released. That's been a fun one to a, a short, small one. The card deck, I think, is people are telling me is really um, interesting to use in clinical work because it's one of those pick a card, any card, you know, things, and it takes you on a practice. And so, I oh think, yeah, quickly. So I have read all the other books. I have not experienced the card deck. What does the assumer yeah, get in the card deck? The card deck's great because it divides into sections. There's a section for each for ventral sympathetic dorsal, and then a section for integration, helping the three states work together. And so, if you're working with a client on their sympathetic survival response, you might want to pick a card from the sympathetic section, and it gives you a it gives you a, a bit of sort of psychoed about a certain practice, why, what it's doing. It gives you the practice and it gives you a tip to continue the practice between sessions. So it's really fun to do. And many colleagues have said, I just spread them out on the table face down and let people pick whatever they want, because whatever they pick is certainly relevant because it's all nervous system regulation. It's, it's helping clients reduce survival responses and increase regulated ones. Last question. You've done such a great work in such a relatively short amount of time. We look 10 years from now, where do you hope polyvagal theory will be and what is the next iteration or evolution of this? Yeah, 10 years from now, my first hopes is that there will be a polyvagal component to academic programs, both clinical programs, medical school, that it will be woven in so that you don't have to graduate and then decide, oh, there's this whole other realm that I have no education about. I'm, I'm so hoping that happens, that we it weaves its way into to all of these academic institutions. Beyond that, it's interesting because I think I'd like this language to become common everyday language that people just speak about their nervous system. I think for humans, this is important for every human to learn how to operate their nervous system in some way. That will then begin to change the dynamics of human relationship. I do think technology is coming. Ways to measure where you are moment to moment, different from any of the heart rate measures that are out there now, but more of an autonomic experience around that. Technology that we are going to use in our clinical offices We've got a, a piece of technology now that we're just beta testing that, that is a non-contact camera that uses the client's face to then translate that into a cube that changes color because the blood vessels underneath the face show what your heart rate variability, which is a measure of nervous system state. And then you see the colors on a cube changing and you can feel what's happening in the client's nervous system, things like that, and things that I can't even dream of yet that scientists are beginning to create, because I do think there's an art and a science to our clinical work. I've always thought that. We are both scientists and artists in as clinicians, and I think a way to weave the science underneath the, the art of what we're doing is our way forward. Yeah. And, and I couldn't say it any better, and even... As frontline clinicians, the uh, bread and butter of our, our listener base, that to be able to psychoeducate and understand the science behind what you're delivering the room is so important in order to be credible both to our consumers, potential clients, and to the larger uh, stakeholders and, and the scientific fields. Deb Dana, I cannot thank you enough. What a thought provoking conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. For MFTs, addressing mistrust in couples due to alcohol misuse can be one of the greatest challenges. Soberlink is your ally in this journey. Trusted for over a decade, it delivers real-time, discreet proof of sobriety, fostering accountability and healing in your clients. Elevate your practice with a solution that meets the core issues head-on. Make every session more impactful. Request free materials from Soberlink. That's www.soberlink.com slash A-A-M-F-T. Soberlink.com slash A-A-M-F-T. Immerse yourself, share with clients, and witness transformation.
Eli back with you, bringing to a close another informative installment of the AMFT podcast, where we seek to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. Certainly an innovator of bringing polyvagal theory into practice, Deb Dana. That was a great interview. She is so articulate. And that's only part one. On the next episode, we're going to have part two with the founder who you heard her mention many time, neuroscientist, the great Dr. Stephen Porges. If you want more on Deb, go to rhythmofregulation.com. That's Deb Dana's Rhythm of Regulation, the science of feeling safe enough to fall in love with life and take the risk of living. You can find a polyvagal perspective on how we are human is Deb says, so there's polyvagal theory for clinicians and for curious people. And if you want to see Deb and Stephen live, the Legacy Talks live from Atlantic Beach, Florida, November 10th and 11th, right around the corner. It's live and it's virtually online. Registration is open in-person seating is limited, but you can find all you want at the polyvagalinstitute.org where you can find courses and learning, everything, the latest polyvagal research, Legacy Talks Live, bringing polyvagal theory to life for therapists and all types of mental health clinicians, including MFTs, Stephen and Deb. You won't want to miss that. I think there's about 10 continuing education units available. I get many questions about what I'm doing outside of the podcast and these common factors I refer to uh, periodically on episodes like we talked today about operationalizing an alliance, tear and repair when we're talking about co-regulation. You, know, you can find out everything I'm doing, uh, elicaram.com, including a book I wrote with AMFT president-elect Dr. Adrian Blow, bringing common factors to life where we want to renew your motivation, energy, and creativity in your systemic therapy and teach you how to integrate from a common factors perspective that will take away the staleness and hopefully reinvigorate the way you practice individual couple and family systemic therapy. We have lots of handy tools and exercises in there and used by both young and senior therapists alike. Please drop me a line. I'm at Eli at NorthstarCounselingCenter.com. If you're a regular listener, we thank you for your continued support. And if you just turn us on today because you're interested in polyvagal theory, I'd like to remind you we have five seasons worth of shows that explore cutting-edge clinical topics that relation-based therapists care about. We have great, unique conversations like the one you just heard with established experts and pioneers in our MFT world of systemic therapy. As always, subscribe and listen wherever you get your favorite podcasts by searching AMFT Podcast. I'm partial to iTunes and Spotify, and we'd really appreciate a review. Feel free to reach out at that email, Eli at NorthstarCounselingCenter.com and let me know what topics you'd like to see covered in future episodes. Until next time, my friends, stay safe, stay systemic.